In this lesson, we will discuss the idea of cosets of a subgroup, and we will we'll look at several properties of cosets. So let's begin with our definition of cosets. Let H be a subgroup of a group G. Then for any element A in G, we define the left coset of H in G. This is the set written A times H and it's defined as the set of all possible products A H such that H is an element of the subgroup H. So we're multiplying A on the left of every element in H and looking at all the elements in this set and this is called the left coset of H and G. Similarly the right coset of H and G is the set written H A the set of all products H A again such that H is in subgroup H. So you now we multiply every element of H on the right by A and look at the set of all these elements. This is called the right coset of H. Another definition is what we call the conjugate of H. The element A H A inverse is called the conjugate of H by A. And the set of all possible conjugates is called the conjugate of the group H by A. So the set A, H, A inverse is the set of all elements A, little h, A inverse, such that H is in subgroup H. This is called the conjugate of capital H by A. So these are our definitions of cosets. In this lesson, we will primarily be focusing on the left cosets of a subgroup H. So let's give an example of this new definition. Let G be the group S3, the symmetric group on three elements. And let's look at the subgroup generated by the permutation 1, 3. So let's let H be the subgroup generated by the permutation 1, 3. Well, since any two cycle is its own inverse, we see that this, this subgroup only contains the identity permutation 
and the element 1, 3. Because 1, 3 times itself would equal the identity element. So by definition, the left cosets of H and G would be the sets where we take any element of G and multiply it on the left times all the elements of H. So then the left cosets of H and G are the following sets. Well, if I take one, the identity permutation times H, that would just multiply the elements of H by the identity, so you would just get H. If I take the permutation one, two, and multiply on the left by H, then this would be the set of containing the products one, two times one, and one, two, one, three. So let's simplify this. Well, one, two times the identity is just one, two. And the product one, two, one, three would take one to three, and then it would take three and map it to one and then one would get sent to two on the left, so three would be getting mapped to two. So we see that this simplifies to the three cycle, one, three, two. Now the left coset one, three times H would be one, three times one and 1, 3 times 1, 3. Well, this would give the, the product 1, 3. And 1, 3 times 1, 3 would give the identity. So we see that this left coset, 1, 3 times h, would actually just equal h. 2, 3 times h be the set containing the products 2, 3 times 1 and 2, 3 times 1, 3. When we simplify, we get 2, 3 and 2, 3, 1, 3 would give us the permutation 1, 2, 3. Now 1, 2, 3 times H Contains the products 1, 2, 3 times 1 and 1, 2, 3, 1, 3. When we simplify, we get the set containing 1, 2, and 3. And then 1, 2, 3 followed by 1, 3 reduces to the permutation 2, 3. And then finally, there are six elements of S3. So the last one is the permutation 1, 3, 2 times H. So this is the set 1, 3, 2 times 1, and then 1, 3, 2 times 1, 3, which reduces to the set containing 1, 3, 2, and then the element 1, 2. So notice that we have six left cosets. Two of these cosets, two of these left cosets are equal to H. Two of these cosets are equal to the set containing one, two, and one, three, two. And the other two cosets are contain the elements two, three, and one, two, three. So it's not a coincidence that these cosets are either disjoint or they're equal and they all have the same order. These are some of the properties that we will look at in a few minutes. So now let's look at an example of left cosets when the group is 
abelian and the operation is addition. So let's let g be the set of integers mod 9. So this group contains the residue classes 0, 1, 2, up to 8. And let's consider the subgroup H, which is generated by the element 3. So this subgroup would contain all the multiples of 3 in this set. So that would be the set containing 0, 3, and 6. And recall this group is under addition mod 9. So when you have a group where the operation is addition, instead of the multiplication notation for the left cosets, we're actually going to use additive notation. So when the group operation is addition, We use the following additive notation for left cosets, a plus h instead of a times h. So let's look at the left cosets of h and g. So now the identity element 0 plus h, well if you take all the elements 0, 3, and 6 and add 0 to each one of these elements, you just get exactly 0, 3, and 6. Now the left coset 1 plus h will contain the elements 1, 4, and 7. You're just adding 1 to the element 0, 3, and 0, 3, and 6. And then 2 plus h will contain the elements 2, 5, and 8. Now there's six more left cosets, but they're actually going to be repeated. Because if we add a multiple of 3, like 3 plus h, we'll still get the, the subgroup h. So the left coset 3 plus h will still be just equal to h. And then 4 plus h, when we reduce mod 9, we'll still get the set containing the numbers 1, 4, and 7. And similarly, 5 plus h, when we reduce mod 9, will still give us the elements 2, 5, and 8. And then likewise, 6 plus h will, will just end up giving us the set h. The left cosets 1 plus h and 4 plus h are both equal to the left coset 7 plus h. And then finally 8 plus h is equal to, again, the set 2, 5, and 8. So look at this example and compare it to the last example. Again, we see that the left cosets are either disjoint, meaning they have no elements in common, or they are equal. Further, each one of the cosets has exactly three elements in this, in this example. In the previous example, each coset had two elements. So it is true that every left coset will have the same order. So let's, let's write this up. In the previous examples, Notice that the 
cosets are either equal If you look at any two cosets, they're either equal or completely disjoint. And another thing, they all have the same order. So these are actually two properties of, of all left cosets that we will prove in a few minutes. Again, notice in general, so further, cosets are not necessarily subgroups. And although we only looked at left cosets, if we did some examples with right cosets, we would actually notice that a left coset of A would not necessarily equal the right coset of A. And this is the case when G is not abelian. So if G is not abelian, And the left coset AH does not always equal the right coset. HA. Clearly, if G is abelian, then they then AH would definitely equal HA just by commuting the elements of the products. But to see this is true for non-abelian groups, let's look at an example. In S3, with our subgroup H equal to the subgroup generated by 1, 3, let's look at a left coset. The left coset one two H equals the set containing one two and one three two, while the right coset H one two. would contain the elements one, two, but it can also contains the three cycle one, two, three. So we see that when the group is non-abelian, like S3, a left coset, AH, does not necessarily equal the right coset, HA. Now we'll prove some important properties of cosets. So now we're going to prove seven properties of cosets that will be very useful in proving some important theorems later. So we give these seven properties and then we'll give the proofs of each one as we go along. Throughout, let's let G be a group. And H is going to be a subgroup of G. And let's let A and B be arbitrary elements of the group G. And the first property tells us that A is always an element of the left coset AH. And so the proof is pretty short. Since H is a subgroup of G, the identity element is an H. So since one is an H, we can write A as 
a times one, which is an element of the left coset AH. So every left coset AH contains the element A. The second property, the left coset AH equals the subgroup H if and only if A is an element of the subgroup H. So this property says that the left coset AH equals H exactly when A is in H. So you can kind of think of it as saying that H absorbs A exactly when A is in H. So the left coset AH actually just reduces to H. So let's begin the proof of the second property. Let's prove the forward implication. So if AH equals H, then A, which is equal to A times one, the identity, this is an element of AH, but AH equals H. Thus, A is an element of H. Now for the reverse implication, we're gonna assume that A is an H. So now suppose a is an H, and we're going to show that the left coset AH actually equals H. Then AH is an H for all little H's in H. Because H is a subgroup and therefore it's closed under multiplication. So every product AH is in the set H. Since H is closed under the group operation. So we see that the left coset AH must be a subset of H. Now we're going to show the reverse containment. Since A is an H, and H is a subgroup and therefore closed under inverses. We know that A inverse is an H. Then for any little h, in H, we know that A inverse H is an H, again, because A inverse is an H, little h is an H, so H is closed under multiplication. And thus, H, which can be written as A, a inverse H is in the left coset AH. Therefore, we've shown that H is a subset of the left coset AH. And since both sets are subsets of each other, we can conclude that they are actually equal.
that finishes the proof of property two. Property three tells us that if I take the product AB and multiply it on the left by H, this is the coset created by multiplying every element of H by AB on the left. This left coset actually equals the coset A times the left coset BH. An analogous result holds for right cosets, that is H times AB is equal to the right coset HA times B. So this property says that the left coset of H created by multiplying H on the left by AB is the same as the coset created by multiplying H on the left by B and then on the left by A. And again, the similar result holds for right cosets. So the proof actually follows from the associativity of the group operation. As we consider an element of the left coset AB times H, you have an element AB times H, but by associativity, this is the same as A times the element BH. And the same thing for right multiplication, H times the element AB is the same as HA times B. So that establishes property three. So property four establishes the property that we noticed in the two examples earlier, that two left cosets are either identical or they're completely disjoint. So the left coset AH equals the left coset BH or their intersection is empty. So this tells us that two left cosets are either identical or they're disjoint. So in general, if you have the intersection of two sets, the intersection is either the empty set or it's not the empty set. So either AH intersect BH is the empty set or AH intersect BH does not equal the empty set. So we need to show that if this intersection is non-empty, then actually AH is equal to BH. So let's suppose that the intersection is non-empty. So let's say AH intersect BH does not equal the empty set. And we need to show that AH equals BH. So since this intersection is non empty, let's assume that we have an element C in this intersection. So let C be in the intersection of AH and BH. Then C is in AH, and therefore we could write C as A times some element H1. in H. 
But similarly, C is in BH, and we can write C as B times some H2. Then A H1 equals C, and that equals B H2. So by multiplying on the right by H1 inverse, we have that A equals B H2 H1 inverse. So now we take an arbitrary element A H in the left coset A capital H. Then I can write A H as B H two H one inverse times H, but notice that the three letters on the right H two H one inverse and H are all in the set H. So this equals B times H two H one inverse H. B times this element of H is in the left coset B H. So we've just shown that A H is actually a subset of B H. So we took an arbitrary element of A H and showed that it was in B H. Well, similarly, we can show the reverse containment because B is A H one H two inverse. And any element in the left coast at BH, so any element BH in this left coset can be written as BH is a H one H two inverse H which again is in the left coset a h because h1 h2 inverse h is an element of h so we have the reverse containment b h is contained in a h since these two sets contain each other we conclude that they are equal. So AH equals BH. So this finishes property four. So we see that given two left cosets, these two left cosets will either be identical or they will be completely disjoint. Next property five says that the left coset AH equals BH if and only if the element A inverse B is in H. So we begin with the proof of the forward implication. So suppose AH equals BH. Then by property one, we know that A is in AH. But AH equals BH, and thus A is an element of BH as well. So since A is in BH, we can write A equal to BH for some 
H and the subgroup H. Then the identity element, which equals A inverse times A. Now substituting for A, this equals A inverse times B H. So we see that A inverse B times the element H equals the identity. And so therefore, the inverse of H must equal A inverse B. But remember H is a subgroup and is therefore closed under inverses. So since H is closed under inverses, A inverse B, which equals H inverse, must be in H. That proves the forward implication. If A H equals B H, then A inverse B is an element of H. Now for the reverse implication, let's assume that A inverse B equals some element H in the subgroup H. Then I can write B as AH, which is an element of the left coset AH. But since B is also in BH, we see that B is actually in the intersection of AH and BH. Therefore, we've shown that the intersection of AH and BH is not disjoint. And therefore, by property four, we see that the left coset AH actually equals BH. This finishes the proof of property five. And property six will establish the fact that all left cosets have the same size. So the order of the left coset AH equals the order of the left coset BH. So this is an important property that will establish the fact that all cosets have the same size. So for the proof, we're going to actually construct a bijection from the left coset AH to BH. And therefore, these sets will have to have the same amount of elements. Their orders will be the same. So let's define the function F from AH to BH. by f of a little h equals b times little h. Then we need to show that this is a bijection. So if f of a h1 equals f of a h2, then BH1 will equal BH2. 
And then by left cancellation of B, that implies that H1 equals H2. Therefore, when we multiply on the left by A, we get that AH1 equals AH2. So F must be one to one. Now if you let B little h be in the codomain BH, we see that BH equals F of AH. So F is on to. So we've constructed a bijection from these two sets, therefore their orders must be the same. So in our beginning examples of left cosets, we saw that a left coset is not necessarily a subgroup of the group G. So property seven, the final property that we're going to prove, establishes when a left coset is actually a subgroup. Property seven says that the left coset AH is actually a subgroup of G if and only if A is an element of H. And this matched up with our previous examples. So for the proof, first let's suppose AH is a subgroup of G. Then the identity one is in the left coset AH. And therefore, the intersection of AH and the left coset 1H is non empty. Well, the left coset 1H is just H. So by property 4, we see that AH equals 1H, which just equals H. So by property two, since AH equals H, we know that A must be an element of H. Now for the reverse implication, Let's suppose A is an H. Then again, by two, AH equals H, but we've assumed throughout that H is a subgroup of G. So therefore, AH is a subgroup of G as well. So this finishes the proofs of our seven properties. And several of these properties will be used to prove a very important theorem called Lagrange's theorem. Property one states that the element A is in the left coset AH. So every element of G is in a left coset. Now property four tells us that two left cosets are either identical or disjoint and Property six tells us that all cosets have the same size. So combining properties one, four, and six, we can conclude that left cosets of a subgroup H partition a group G into blocks of equal size. So these properties will be used to prove a very important theorem called Lagrange's theorem.